All right, 2 Corinthians 11. Just read uh, verse 1 to 4. Uh, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth an another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well uh, bear with him. Now, I just want to preach this morning on uh, a few subtle forms of work salvation that are creeping into churches, that are creeping into in, even the independent Baptist movement. Um, and I just want to expose them for the heresies that they are this morning. And, you know, the Bible says here in verse 3, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And the first thing I want to say is, you know, salvation truly is simple, isn't it? Salvation truly is simple. And what do I mean by that? Because you might be thinking, well, Victor, if salvation is so simple, why are you spending hours and hours and sermon upon sermon explaining salvation if it's so simple? And, you know, you might be thinking, well, you know, if salvation is so simple, then why is it so complex? And, you know, uh, on uh, Thursday night, uh, Kevin and I met up with a guy from the Sunshine Coast named Daniel. And we had dinner together uh, just to meet up, have some fellowship. And, you know, we were talking over dinner and we, we were talking about the salvation plan. Not the plan of salvation, but the salvation plan in the sense, you know, what Jesus had to do, right? The, the death, the life, you know, what did the death mean? You know, was it, was, there was a physical, uh, was there a spiritual death? Um, you know, the, the burial, why did the body need to be buried? Uh, what the blood meant, the blood atonement, you know, was it sprinkled on the mercy seat in heaven? Was there a mercy seat in heaven? Or just, just all these things. Uh, even talking about the resurrection and the, and, and the importance of the resurrection. And, you know, when you think about what Jesus had to do in order to save us, it does start to get complex. But why does the Bible say that it's the simplicity in Christ, that, that the gospel is simple? Well, let me give you an analogy. You know, let's say you need to fix your car, right? And trying to figure out how, you, how to fix your car, that gets pretty complicated, doesn't it? Because you need to know how the car works and all the different parts and equipment you would need. But how easy, it is it, how easy is it if you can just give your car to a mechanic and then your mechanic just takes care of it? So it, even though a car can become very complex, putting your faith, and using the analogy, putting your faith in a mechanic and letting the mechanic take care of everything and just give you back a new and working car or fixed car, it's very simple, isn't it? Because it takes that complexity off you and it puts it on the mechanic that is fixing the car for you. And that's why salvation is so simple. Even though Jesus had to go through a lot, he had to fulfill all the scriptures and that gets quite complex. When we hand it all over to him, when we put our faith in him, it's very simple because it's like somebody saying, you know, I'm going to take care of that. So let's say you give your car to the mechanic and he's going to take care of it, he's going to fix your car for you. Now after your car is fixed, if you wanted to then go and understand what the mechanic actually did to fix that car, that takes a bit more work, doesn't it? It takes a bit more understanding. And that's why when we preach about salvation and we discuss salvation, it does get really complex. But do we need to know all this in order to be saved? No, we just need to put our faith in the quote unquote uh, mechanic. So salvation is, is truly simple because it's just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, it's very clear in the Bible that salvation is not by works. And we'll just show you a couple of verses there really quick. Knowing that a man, this is Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh uh, be justified. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, 
that we should walk in them. So very clear in the Bible, and we can turn to other scriptures, but we won't. You know, Romans 3.28, therefore uh, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So very, very clear in the Bible that salvation is by faith and it's not of works um, at all. But, you know, we see here in Ephesians 2 that there's nothing wrong with works, is there? You know, we are saved to do good works. You know, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we're not against good works. Well, you know, good works are called good works for a reason because they're good. They're works that are good. They're things that we ought to do that God does command us to do. But it's when somebody believes that you need works in order to be saved, that's when it becomes heresy because we are saved by grace through faith and that not of works, but God saved us to do good works. Um, we, we, he commands us to do good works, but they are not a prerequisite to be saved. And if somebody believes that they are a prerequisite, that is when they are now preaching false doctrine. They are now preaching heresy. Now, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, you know, because if Satan wants to spread a false doctrine, he wants to spread um, work salvation, the heresy of work salvation, I mean, he's not just going to come out and say it, is he? He's not just going to come out and say, you know, I believe in work salvation. If somebody's going to preach a false doctrine, if they're going to preach work salvation, they're not just going to get up on a Sunday morning and say, I believe in work salvation. Because it's so obvious in the Bible that it says it's not by works, that, that would be too obvious, that would be too blatant. So it's, it's always going to come across subtle. That's why the Bible says um, that the, servant, the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that it is in Christ. So if false doctrine is going to creep into churches, it's going to creep in to what preachers are teaching and believing, it's going to come across a lot more subtly. And we're going to cover a couple of those this morning. Um, you know, that's why when you see gospel tracts that seem to be preaching salvation by faith, salva salvation by grace, these subtle forms of work salvation always appear at the end. Right? They always appear in, in one sentence near the end or they appear in the prayer. And it's funny that these, these gospel tracts that promote these subtle forms of work salvation, you don't hear anything in the gospel tract. You don't read anything in the gospel tract about making, for example, making Jesus the Lord of your life. But then yet they include that in the prayer at the end of the gospel tract. You know, now I, do, I do now accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. Well, if that's what you had to do in order to be saved, and that's what you had to confess to God, why didn't you explain any of that in the gospel tract? It's like they're trying to sneak it in at the end there, um, this, uh, this heresy of work salvation. But let's just cover a few of them uh, this morning. But number one, One subtle form of work salvation is when somebody believes, and this is very uh, popular or very uh, common or uh, prevalent amongst the Catholics and the Orthodox, is they'll say something like, well, I believe in Jesus, but I still have to do my part. I still have to do my best. Now, the problem with that is, is if we read in Romans 11, verse 6, it says, uh, well, let's read from verse 5, actually. Even so, then, at this present time, also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So you're part of this remnant by the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Now, what is this verse teaching? This verse is teaching that grace and works cannot be mixed. You can't have a mixture of grace and works because if you add works to grace, it becomes works. Um, and if you try to add grace to works, it's not going to make it grace. It's still going to be works. So grace and works have to be completely separate. And, you know, we use the analogy when we go out soul winning of a gift. You know, we, if you give somebody a gift, even if you had to pay even one cent for it, or five cents for it, because we don't have one cent anymore, right? Even if you had to pay five cents for for it, it's not a gift anymore. A gift has to be completely free. Now, it may be a cheap, a cheap purchase, but it's not free. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, not the, uh, the purchase, I guess, of, of Christ. Um, so this having to do my part 
is work salvation because if you add any works to grace, uh, it becomes works. Uh, Romans 4 says here, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So you see, if you work for something, you're no longer receiving it by grace. It's something that is owed to you. It's, it's a debt that is owed to you. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Now another problem with this uh, doctrine of you know, having to do your part. You know, I believe in Jesus. You know, Jesus does most of the part, but I still have to do my part. You know, the problem with that is if you have to do your part, do your own part in order to be saved, you're not going to go to heaven because your part becomes the whole part, you know, if you have to do your part. Look at what it says in James 2, verse 8. It says, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. You know, so you're keeping the commandment if you love your neighbor as yourself. But if you have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So James 2 is teaching here that you have to keep the whole law in order to not be a transgressor of the law. So if you have to do your part in order to be saved, you have to do the whole part. Now sometimes people wonder, you know, why does it say here, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, is he guilty of all? You know, is that verse teaching that if you lie, it's as though you've committed murder. Because some people take this passage to mean, oh, you know, that's all sin is equal. You know, even if you steal a paperclip, that's the same as raping a little child, which is, is totally ludicrous. If you think that, then that, that's crazy. Uh, that's not what that verse is teaching. What it's saying is, if you read it in context of the other passages surrounding it, whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. What does that mean? Well, in verse 9, it says here, but if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. And again in verse 11, Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So it's not that if you commit adultery, if you don't commit adultery, yet if, that yet if thou kill, you become an adulterer, meaning that you've committed adultery. You haven't. It's saying that you've, you're a transgressor of the law, that you've committed sin, you've broken the law. So that's what you're guilty of. You're guilty of breaking the law as a whole, even though you haven't committed every sin contained within that law, you've um, come short of the glory of God. That's what verse 10 is teaching. Um, but let's look also at Galatians 5. Another passage teaching the same principle. Reading from verse 1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now why is he saying that? Because there were people creeping into the Galatian church, trying to teach that they had to be circumcised in order to be saved. And Paul is saying that if you believe you have to be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. So it's not that Christ is going to you know, pay the majority and that circumcision is going to do your part. Uh, Christ shall profit you nothing because he says here in verse 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. See, isn't that what we read in James 2? That if you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. You're a debtor to do the whole law here. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are justified by the law. You are fallen from grace. Uh, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. So that is one subtle form of work salvation because they'll say, I believe in Jesus. You know, if you ask them, I believe in Jesus. But then they say, but I have to do my part. If you have to do your part, that's making salvation works. And that is heresy. So what's another subtle form of, of work salvation? Well, another form of, uh, another subtle form of work salvation is this thought of giving your life to Jesus. Uh, or, you know, they might say committing your life to Jesus or, you know, surrendering your life to Jesus or sacrificing your will 
to God's will. It comes in many different forms, doesn't it? Giving your life to Jesus, giving your heart to Jesus, committing your heart to Jesus, uh, sacrificing your will to the will of God. And you know what's interesting about this form of work salvation is, it's, 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 is that it's the complete op opposite of salvation, isn't it? It's, it's the total opposite of what salvation is. And let's just look at a couple of verses that show that. Uh, Matthew... Uh, 20 verse 27. Look at what the Bible says here. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. See, so we don't give our life to Jesus. Jesus gave his life for us. Uh, John 3.16 says, I won't turn there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, God gave to us. We didn't give to God in order to be saved. John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven. Jesus talking about himself. That a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So you see there, are we giving our life to Jesus? No, Jesus says, I'm going to give my flesh. I'm going to give in order for you to have life. Uh, let's look at... Um, you know, John 5. Oops. Sorry, 1 John 5. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. So we have to believe the record in order to have the witness in, our, in ourselves and be saved. And what is the record? This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life and this life is in his son. So the record is that God has given to us, not that we have given to God. Uh, let's read from Galatians 1 as well. Grace be to you, verse 3, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. You know, and maybe the re reason why people are so easily sucked into this idea of salvation being a gift, yet we have to give our life, give our life to Christ or commit our life to Jesus, you know, because we live in a day where our idea of gifts may be so twisted because we live in a day where you do have to spend a lot of money these days to receive gifts. If you think about it, if you want to throw a party, you need to spend a lot of money and then people will come and give you a birthday present. Or, you know, a wedding, right? People give you a wedding gift, but really it's paying back what you had to pay to even hold the wedding and to feed them and to, and to, to give them that special day. So, you know, maybe that's why it's so easy for people to get sucked into that, this idea that, yeah, it's still a gift, even though I have to give everything to Jesus, but it, it makes no sense at all. It's the complete opposite of the gospel. So, you know, doing your part, is works. Uh, giving or committing your life to Jesus, sacrificing your will to His is works. Because you know when you sacrifice your will, you basically keep doing His will, right? Which is His commandments. That's works. If you have to do that to be saved, it's work salvation. What's another subtle form of work salvation? Well, I mentioned it when I was talking about the gospel track, but making Jesus not only your Savior, but also your Lord. Uh, look at what it says in Luke uh, 6 verse 46 he says here and why call ye me Lord Lord and do not the things which I say so what is Jesus saying here he's saying here if you call me Lord Lord and don't do the things which I say then you're not really making me your Lord are you because in order to make Jesus your Lord you have to do the things which I say well what's another way What's another way to uh, phrase the things that Jesus says? It's his commandments, aren't they? So people aren't going to say, you know, 
keep the commandments in order to be saved, but they'll say you have to make Jesus your Lord. But that's just another way of saying, do the things that he says. Another way of saying, keep his commandments. It's work salvation. Now, do you have to make Jesus your savior to be saved? Yes. But do you have to make Jesus your Lord to be saved? No, because if you did, that's work salvation. You know, in a very uh, popular quote that people will say in order to promote work salvation or promote this lordship salvation as it's known is they'll say if he's not lord at all sorry if he's not lord of all he's not lord at all have you ever heard that if he's not lord of all he's not lord at all well let's look at a couple of verses in the bible just in regards to this because if he's not lord at, at, of all if he's not lord of all if he's not lord of all then he's not lord at all then he's not the Lord of anyone that still sins. Because when you sin, at that point in time, Jesus Christ is not your Lord. Sin is your Lord at that point, or you are your Lord. Uh, look at what jo uh, Jesus says in John 8, 34. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. So anybody that commits sin, which is all of us in this room today, and anyone who's ever walked the face of this earth that is, that is a believer, commits sin. When we commit sin, at that point in time, Jesus is not our Lord. So if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all, then he's not the Lord of anyone that still sins. Uh, Romans 6, just another passage on this point. Romans 6, verse 16. Look at what this verse says. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So that verse is saying there, if ye yield yourself to sin, if you sin, then you are a servant of sin, just as uh, Jesus was saying in John 8 there in that verse we saw before. So making Jesus not only Saviour, but also Lord, is just another subtle form of work salvation. What's another one? Being able to lose your salvation is a subtle form of work salvation. Uh, and you know, this also comes in the form of, you know, if you don't have the works, then you weren't really saved. Because what they're basically saying is that, you know, you didn't really have salvation. Um, you know, another way to think of it is, well, if you had salvation, you now no longer have it because you didn't keep the works. You know, once saved, always saved is what we believe at this church here. And it's so clear in the Bible that once a person is saved, they're always saved. You know, John 3, that you have everlasting life. It's not something you get in the future. You have it. It's present tense. You know, John 5, 24 says that you shall not come into condemnation. So you're not ever going to be condemned in the future. You know, John 10, 28 says that he'll give unto us eternal life and we shall never perish. So if there's a way, once you have eternal life, you perish, then Jesus is lying, isn't he, in John 10, 28? But Jesus can't lie because he's God. You know, Jude 1, 1 says that we're preserved in Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not us that are preserving our salvation. It's Jesus Christ that's preserving it. You know, Ephesians 4.30, I'm just blowing through a couple of these. Ephesians 4.30 says that we're sealed unto the day of redemption. We're not sealed until we commit a really bad sin. We're sealed unto the day of redemption. And Hebrews 13.5 says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. So, you know, once saved, always saved in the Bible is very clear. And, you know, there are basically three ways that people believe that you can lose salvation. Um, one of them is by committing a really bad sin. You know, either it's committing suicide or murder. murder. And, you know, that's why when we go soul winning, we give that example, just to, to test their understanding that salvation is eternal. So there are three ways people believe that you can lose your salvation. You know, one is committing a really bad sin. And really all that is, is not keeping the commandments. Because when you sin, you're not keeping the commandments. That's just work. So if you could lose your salvation by committing a really bad sin, you're basically obtaining your salvation by works. But what's another way people believe that you can lose your salvation? They say something like, well, you have eternal life, but if you walk away from the faith, if you, you know, turn away from Jesus Christ, then you'll lose your salvation. 
Well, what does it mean to walk away from the faith? What do they even mean by that? They mean that you're not keeping the commandments. You know, if you're not keeping the commandments, you're not in church, you're not reading your Bible, then you won't have salvation. And that's just another way of preaching work salvation, that you have to keep the faith in terms of the works. Uh, and if you stop, if you walk away from the faith, or you stop doing the works, then you're not going to be saved. But what's a third way that people think that you can lose your salvation that is a, is a little even more subtle than saying that you'll walk away from the faith or you know, that you're committing a really bad sin? They'll say like, well, what if I stop believing? If I stop believing, then I, I could lose my salvation because salvation's by faith. But if I stop believing, do I then lose my salvation? Well, number one, no, because I believe salvation is a one-way street. You know, once you believe on Jesus Christ, even if you then tried not to believe, it's too late. Jesus Christ has already has you in his hand. He said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'll never, you'll never perish. And the way I like to think of it is this. You know, Simon is my son no matter what. Now, if I'm holding on to Simon, if he's in my hand, the harder he tries to get away from me, what happens? It's the harder I grip, don't I? So if I'm in the hand of Jesus Christ... Even if I try to get out of Jesus Christ's hand, he's just going to grip even harder. He's not going to let me get out of his hand. And also, you know, if Simon says, comes to me and says, you know, Dad, I don't believe you're my dad anymore. I believe the guy across my street is my dad. Does that, make, does that stop him from being my son? I mean, he's already born into my family. It's too late. He's my son no matter what. So that's one way we can understand, you know, that even if you were to stop believing, you would still be uh, saved. You would not lose your salvation. But think of it this way as, as well, because you know, it's a bit subtle to say, well, what if you stop believing, are you, are, you, are you still saved? But think about it this way. If you stop believing on Jesus Christ, if you stop believing that salvation is by grace, what is your only other alternative? To believe it's by works. See, you can't stop believing that salvation is by grace without believing that it's by works. Um, so if somebody believes that they can lose their salvation by, stop, by, by, by ceasing to believe on Jesus Christ and receiving the grace of God, their only other option is to believe it's by works and therefore it's works salvation in, in any way to, to lose your salvation. This is why when you talk to Muslims, you need to understand that they, they actually believe that salvation is by grace because the only people they believe um, that go to hell are non-Muslims. Because if you're a Muslim, but you're a Muslim that doesn't keep the commandments, they believe in a purgatory type hell where they'll just burn and pay off their sins in, in their Muslim purgatory, but they'll still eventually go to heaven. So that's why they're not scared about not being good enough to go to heaven, because once they burn off all their sins, they're going to go to heaven regardless. Only if you're not a Muslim, you don't you know, believe in the one God, Allah, are you going to the eternal hell. So in reality... They actually believe in a salvation by grace because they are only trusting Allah to save them. It's just that they don't have their faith on the sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ. They have their faith in a God that can't save, who has promised them mercy, but can't give it because they need a savior to save them. Um, and this is why a Muslim, they, prob they probably don't believe that they can lose their salvation in the sense that they, they don't think that anything they do will ever send them to hell because the only thing that will send them to the eternal hell is not being a Muslim. So I, I guess I hope I'm making myself clear there that if we believe that you can lose your salvation by, by not believing, it's just another form of work salvation because that's your only alternative. But what are a couple of other points in terms of losing your salvation uh, by not believing or being able to lose your salvation by not doing the works. You know, number one, salvation wasn't gained by works, right? It, it's not by works. So how can it be lost through lack of works? You know, if you didn't get, if you didn't obtain salvation by doing good works, why then would you lose it by not doing works? You didn't do works to gain it. Um, but and number two, if you weren't good, and this is related, if you weren't good enough to get saved, how can you be bad enough to, to lose salvation? You know, that doesn't even make sense. How can I be bad enough to lose salvation when I wasn't even good enough to get it in the first place? So that doesn't even make sense. Uh, number three, Jesus gave you salvation, 
Therefore, it would have to be Jesus that takes it from you, right? Because you didn't earn salvation. Jesus gave it to you. So you can't, by your own power, lose salvation. Jesus would have to take it from you. And that would make him a liar because he said, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And number four, something to think about is, you know, when something is free, when something is a gift, when something is grace, it's not a payment plan, is it? It's not like I'm going to give you something free. I'm going to give you this laptop for free, but you have to pay me $100 every year for the next 20 years. That's not uh, grace. That's works. Even if you have to pay after you've received the item, it still works. It's not free. So free is not a payment plan. So losing your, being able to lose your salvation, anyone that teaches that you can lose your salvation, this is heresy, and this is teaching a form of work salvation, and it's very subtle. Even if they say, or oh, even if you stop believing, or if you uh, fall into uh, heresy, if you fall into uh, a false religion, you could lose your salvation because the only other option to not believing on grace uh, is works. So what's another subtle form of uh, work salvation? And I, I didn't have this on my list, but after the Jehovah's Witnesses visited me yesterday, I added this one to my list because it is very common in our churches. And I hope you can see it as I go through these subtle forms of work salvation. I'm turning up the heat and I'm getting closer to home of what the things that we hate. But this one is, it's only faith, right? It's, it's, it's only believe on the Lord Jesus Christ but it must be a genuine faith, right? It has to be a real faith. It has to be a saving faith. And what do they mean by that? It means that you have to have works. You know, uh, clear, that's what they are, uh, they are trying to say. Because they say it's only by faith, but when they say it must be a genuine faith, all they're doing is re redefining the word faith and adding works to salvation. And where do they get this idea from? They get it from James 2, and it's a misunderstanding of James 2. But let's just look at a couple of verses here in James 2. I'm not going to go through the whole chapter. But look from verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou. I just want you to note those words. Seest thou. So who's seeing the faith here? Thou. The thou referring to the brethren that he's addressing this letter to. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by, faith, by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then, right? You see. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And you know, a lot of people are mixing up faith with works because of James 2, because they're mix, mixing up the difference between having a saving faith and a genuine faith, which is a faith that's on the Lord Jesus Christ that is able to save you, and having a profitable or living faith, which is what James 2 is teaching. Because if you have faith but you don't have works it's not going to profit anyone it's not going to be alive for as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without works is dead also it doesn't say that the believer is dead it says that the faith is dead so faith without works is dead because you can have faith on the lord jesus christ but your faith be dead because it doesn't have any works you're still saved your faith is not alive it's not a living faith it's a dead faith. Because let's compare this passage to Romans 4. Romans 4. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Remember, James 2 seemed to allude that Abraham was justified by works. For, because if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So remember in James 2 it said, Seeth thou how faith wrought with his works and by and by works faith was made perfect ye see then how that a man is justified by faith without works uh, justified by by works but the bible says here in romans 4 we need to understand it says abraham if abraham were justified by works he hath whereof to glory 
but not before God. See, our works do not show our faith to God. Our works show our faith to other men. That's why we can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and not have any works and still be saved. And we read this before. Let's read it again. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. And you know, I, I was talking about this with the Jehovah's Witnesses that came to my door yesterday, and I showed them Romans 4, 5, because that, you know, James 2 is obviously the first passage they would go to when you say, you know, do you believe in work salvation? They'll say, well, faith without works is dead. So then I asked them, well, then how do you explain Romans 4? And I read it to them in their Bible because it says not exactly the same thing, but it basically says the same thing that, you know, salvation is by faith apart from works. Um, and it says, you know, God imputes righteousness apart from works. So it's very clear even in their Bible that Romans 4 is teaching that you need to believe and that salvation is by believing on him that justified the godly and not by works. So I said this to them and it was funny because she kept tripping up trying to say that she believes salvation by faith because you can't deny, like we said in the beginning, you can't deny that the Bible says that salvation is not by works, it's by faith. So when I ask her, well, do you believe salvation is by faith? She'll say, yeah, it's by faith. She'll say, she said, oh, we're like this compared to God and, and you know, we can never make ourselves perfect. But then when I asked her the question, well, what if you were to quit the Jehovah's Witness Church? What if you were to leave that religion and turn your back on God and I, and I don't say, would you still go to heaven? I say, would you still make it to that resurrection? And she didn't answer straight away. She had to think about it. And I just said to her, see, the reason why you're thinking about it is because you're still basing your salvation on your works. It doesn't matter that you say that you believe salvation is by faith. The fact that you are considering your own works, whether or not you'll make it to that resurrection, shows that you have your faith in your works. And it's funny because she kept saying that salvation was by faith, salvation was by grace, it's nothing that we can earn. But yet she kept turning to passages to try and promote work salvation. You know, if you believe salvation is by faith, why do you keep turning to James 2? Why do you keep turning to Matthew 24 where it says, He that endureth to the end the same shall be saved? You know, Matthew 25 where it says, Oh, he'll divide the sheep and the goats and they're divided by their works. If you don't believe that salvation is by works, why do you keep going to verses to preach work salvation. Obviously, you have the wrong understanding of those passages and you need to rethink what those passages mean because it's not going to contradict the clear teaching in Scripture that salvation is not by works. So this subtle form of work salvation, yes, you only have to believe, but you only truly believe if you have this genuine faith. And what they mean by that is that you have works. Um, now, what's the last one? The last one that I'm going to cover today is, is our favorite one, right? And I left the last one. I left this one till last. Why did I leave it till what? last? Because it's the worst of all. And that is that you have to repent or turn from your sin in order to be saved. And why is this the worst one in our day and age this day? Because a lot of churches that used to be right on salvation, used to preach salvation by faith alone, are starting to preach this heresy. And not only that, churches that believe salvation by faith and don't believe you have to turn from your sins in order to be saved, allow this heresy to be preached in their churches. What is going on? Uh, and you know, that's why today we want to shine a light on this heresy and expose it for what it is because this heresy of turning from your sins or repenting from your sins for salvation will never be preached in this church while I'm the bishop of this church. You know, I'm not going to have some, you know, big name guest preacher, you know, come in this church and that, I, that, that I supposedly like or whatever and he's going to get up and preach work salvation. You would think if you have somebody come and preach in your church, it doesn't matter how big name they are, wouldn't you figure out whether or not they even preach salvation correctly, preach salvation clearly? You know, and think about it. what does it even mean to turn from sin? You know, they, they use this phrase, repent of your sin, turn from your sin. Think about what this phrase even means. Um, what does it mean to turn from sin? Isn't it just another way to say keep the commandments? Um, you know, let me give you an example. Let's say we take the commandment, the ninth commandment, thou shalt not lie. 
So if the commandment is thou shalt not lie, then what is the sin? The sin is to lie, isn't it? So if the commandment is thou shalt not lie, how do you keep that commandment? You don't lie, right? So if I'm going to turn from the sin of not lying, what do I have to do? Stop lying. So I turn from the sin, turning from the sin of lying is keeping the commandment of not lying. So when, we, when people say you need to turn from your sins or you need to repent of your sins, all they're saying is keep the commandments in another way. And this is why it's so subtle because they won't just come out and say you need to keep the commandments to be saved. Because if they got up and said, you know, you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you need to keep the commandments and then believe on Jesus Christ and then you'll be saved, that, that won't come across well because people will say, wait a second, that's works. But if they get up in their pulpit and they say, well, you need to repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, that's, that's, that's fine. That's, that's not work salvation. That's not heresy. But they're just saying the same thing because to turn from sin is just another way to say, keep the commandments. And you know, we don't believe that you have to repent of your sins to be saved. And you know what people will say when you say that to them? You don't believe in repentance. Now this is a false accusation because do we believe in repentance? Yes, of course we believe in repentance. You know, we believe in repentance to be saved. But we don't believe that you have to repent of your sins to be saved. You know, do we believe in repenting of your sins? Yes, because as believers, we ought to repent of our sins. We ought to turn from our sins and keep the commandments. But do we have to repent of our sin to be saved? No, because this is works salvation. And let me give you a couple of illustrations to, to, to show you how silly this accusation is. Because if I said to you, I don't read the Quran, would you say to me, you don't read? No, it's not that I don't read, it's that I don't read the Quran. I read the Bible. So to say that I don't read, you're missing what, what our actual position is. And when people say, you know, you don't believe in repentance. No, we don't believe in repenting of sin in order to be saved. You know, another illustration would be, you know, when we say, I don't believe in works to be saved. And people will say, you don't believe in works? No, we believe in works. You're not listening to the whole sentence. We believe in works, but we don't believe in works to be saved. And it's the same with repentance. We believe in repentance. I believe in repentance. You have to repent to be saved, but you don't have to repent of sin to be saved. Because the word repent, the word repent is a verb, isn't it? It means to turn or to change. But the question is, when it comes to salvation, what do you need to turn from or what do you need to change in order to be saved? Uh, Hebrews 6. Let's look here. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from sin. No, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Why is it calling, why is it saying repentance of dead works? Because if you're trusting your works to save you, they won't. They're going to kill you. They're going to send you to hell. That's why it's dead works. So we're not repenting from sin and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're repenting from dead works and we're putting our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, some people will say, yeah, but John the Baptist preached repentance. You know, Jesus preached repentance. Well, they did, didn't they? They preached that you had to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. So there's that repenting from dead works and believing the gospel. But we don't even have to guess what the message of John the Baptist and Jesus was because in Acts 19, it defines what the message of John the Baptist was. Look at what it says here in verse 4. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. So there's the baptism of repentance that John was performing saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So did John and Jesus preach repentance? Yes, but what were they preaching when they preached the baptism of repentance? Saying unto the people, so this is what they were saying when they were preaching the baptism of repentance, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Very clear that the baptism of repentance is not turn from your sin or repent of your sin to be saved. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what salvation is. Let's look at this passage in Matthew 21. Matthew 21, reading from verse 25. Verse 23, sorry. <clears throat> and when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I in likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? For if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? So what is, the, what is the context here in this parable he's about to give? It's the baptism of repentance. Did it come from heaven or did it come from men? Verse 28, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not, but afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. So what is this parable talking about? It's talking about two sons. One is saying that he doesn't want to work in the vineyard, but then he repents and then he goes to work in the vineyard. And then another son says, I'm going to go work in the vineyard, but then he changes his mind and doesn't go to the work. And if you read only up until that point, you might get the idea, well, isn't the repentance repenting of sins? Because you know, one son said he wasn't going to keep the commandments and then he repented of that and then he kept the commandments. He kept the commandment of his father. But we don't have to guess what this parable means because if we just read a little further, Jesus actually explains to us what this parable means. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness and ye believed him not. So there's that saying unto them that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. But the publicans and the harlots believed him and ye when ye had seen it repented not afterward that ye might believe him so what is this repentance is it is it them repenting of sin or is it them repenting of the fact that they did not believe on the lord jesus christ well we see here that it's because they didn't believe that's the repentance they needed in order to be saved jonah 3 absolute proof that turning from your sins is works we know the story that jonah went into the city of nineveh and he preached to them to turn from their sins otherwise god was going to destroy the city of nineveh and look at what it says here in verse 6 it says for word came unto the king of nineveh so he's now hearing the words that jonah is preaching in nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and satin ashes and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands, a.k.a. their sins, right? Who can tell if God will turn and repent? And turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. See, the word repent can't mean to turn from sin in and of itself because God repents in the Bible. God doesn't have any sin. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And look at this. And God saw their works. So what did they do, right? They turned from their evil way. It said God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. 
And God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them, and he did it not. Very clear there. I think this is the nail in the coffin for people that believe you have to turn from your sins or repent of your sins to be saved and claim that that is not salvation by works. Because the Bible says here in Jonah 3.10 that God saw their works. What did he see? He saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them and he did it not. The Bible defining there that turning from your evil way, turning from sins is works. And we know that salvation is not by works, but turning from your sins is. You know, I had one preacher tell me once, um, he said, yeah, but that's not talking about works as in keeping the law. That's just saying God saw their works, meaning he, he just saw their deeds. He just saw what they did. But he doesn't, he's not saying that that's the same works um, that Ephesians 2 is talking about. Yeah, but then if we see in Romans 3, and we already went here, therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And we see here in verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified without, by faith without the deeds of the law. So even if you were to change that word works into deeds, our deeds don't save us. Our works don't save us. And if we have to turn from our evil way, that is deeds, that is works. And, you know, somebody might say, you know, well, I don't believe in repenting of your sins to be saved. You know, I don't believe you have to turn from your sins or repent of your sins to be saved. But I'm still going to say it when I preach the gospel. I'm still going to say repentance because John said repentance and Jesus said repentance. Well, you know, I'm not against people saying repentance when they preach the gospel to people. Um, but the reason why I don't say that people have to repent in order to be saved is because... You know, most people nowadays, they think that the word repent means to turn from your sins. So if I'm going to use the word repent to explain the gospel to somebody, but then I have to clarify what that word repent means, because I don't want them to think that I'm preaching work salvation. I'm going to tell them to repent. But then I explain to them, oh, but repent actually just means that you believe on Jesus Christ. Well, to me, then why, not, why even use the word? Because if you're going to use the word and then have to define it for them, why not just explain that salvation is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ instead of using the word repent and then explaining that they have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, this isn't a problem anyway. Because, you know, the book of John, it says here in chapter 20, verse 30, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his, main, through his name. So we see here in John chapter 20, the purpose of the book of John. The purpose of the book of John is that believing you might have life through his name. He's written these that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. So the book of John was a book written for the sole purpose of convincing people that Jesus is the Christ and that people would believe on the name of the Son of God. But you know what's interesting about the book of John? It doesn't mention the word repent, repentance, even one time. So people that are saying, oh, well, you're not preaching the proper plan of salvation. You're not preaching uh, salvation correctly if you don't mention repentance. Well, did John preach salvation right? I mean, he wrote a whole book, 21 chapters, not even mentioning the word repent. Did he mess it up? No, God doesn't mess things up. Because repenting in order to be saved is the same as believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you turn from dead works, you turn from trusting works, you are repenting, you're believing on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. So these are six subtle forms of work salvation. You know, doing your part, uh, you know, giving your life to Jesus, committing your life to Jesus, um, making Jesus the Lord of your life. Uh, you know, being able to lose your salvation is a subtle form of work salvation. You know, having a genuine faith, and what do they mean by that? To have works and not just faith. And turning from your sins or repenting from your sins is work salvation. Um, if, you, if you have to do any of these to be saved, it is preaching heresy. It's heresy. And you might be thinking, you might be thinking, well, Victor, you know, you're just splitting hairs. You know, you're just make, making a mountain out of a molehill. You're just straining at a gnat. Um, you know, because these preachers that 
that say these things. They don't really mean that. That's not what they mean. They're just saying that, but that's not what they mean. You know, you don't have to make a big deal out of it and, and separate over it. And you know, sometimes when you're in the minority and you believe something that the Bible says and it just seems like nobody else is believing this, sometimes you start to think that yourself, don't you? You start to think like, you know, am I, am I wrong? Am I, am I making a big deal out of something that is not a big deal? But, you know, then, then you read the Bible and then you realize maybe I'm not making a big enough deal of it because God makes it a big deal. Look at what it says in Galatians 1 verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And that's what work salvation is. It's another gospel. That's what all these six forms of these subtle work salvation in order to be saved, they are another gospel. They are not the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is what the Bible teaches. They're preaching another gospel, which is not another. So it's not, it isn't another gospel because it's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There's that subtlety that subtle form of work salvation, it's coming across as believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's subtly perverting the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now, does this passage allow for us to have an attitude of, oh yeah, well, they're just preaching a false gospel. They're just preaching work salvation. But they don't, they don't mean it. They're, they're still our friends. They're still our buddies. They're still on the same team. Because sometimes we think that. But what is this verse saying? This verse is saying that if they preach another gospel, let them be accursed. Let them be accursed. Let them go to hell. Look at what it says here in verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you. You know, maybe Muhammad or Joseph Smith should have read their Bible before listening to that satanic spirit pretending to be the angel Gabriel or pretending to be the angel Moroni because even angels from heaven can preach another gospel um, but look here, it says here, but though we, but though we, what, what is Paul saying? He says, even if I come to you preaching another gospel, don't believe it. Believe what the Bible says. That, that's a pretty strong statement because he's saying, if any, because he says later on, if any man preach unto you another gospel, which he have not received, let him be accursed because that's somebody else. But he includes here in verse 8, but though we are an angel from heaven, even if an, a, a true apostle of Jesus Christ, even if one of the 12 came to you preaching another gospel, Paul is saying here, let him be accursed. And what does that mean to us? You know, even if your favorite preacher, even if your favorite independent, fundamental Baptist preacher comes to you preaching another gospel, the Bible says here, let him be accursed. Um, because we don't put men above, you know, what the Word of God says and what the truth is. And, you know, people will say, you know, oh, but that, how can that preacher be preaching a work salvation? I mean, he's helping so many people. You know, look how big his church is. Oh, he's such a lovely guy. But if he's preaching work salvation, what does the Bible say? I mean, I didn't write this. And to me, I mean, this seems pretty harsh, right? To me, in, in the flesh, when I read that and say, well, if they're preaching work salvation, let them be a curse. And he says it twice because he's emphasizing how serious this topic is. Now, am I, saying, am I saying that if somebody is saved and they preach a work salvation, are they going to hell? No, because once you're saved, you cannot go to hell. But people will say, you know, it's, it's just semantics. You know, they're, they're just saying that, but they don't really mean it. But then if they don't really mean it, then stop saying it. You know, if you don't mean for people to turn from their sins to be saved, then stop telling people to turn or repent of their sins to be saved. If that's not what you believe, then stop saying it. You know, we don't need a bunch of preachers in the pulpits of Australia today not being clear about salvation. I mean, if they can't preach salvation clearly, what are they doing in the pulpit? 
If they can't teach people what believing on the Lord Jesus Christ means and that it's not by works and they're using phrases that imply works, then they should not be in the pulpit. Get somebody else to preach in their place. You know, I, you know, I do understand. You know, I, I, I do understand you know, that there are preachers out there and even preachers we know who say these things. Um, you know, that, that are not intentionally trying to preach a work salvation. You know, there are preachers out there that are intentionally trying to preach work salvation and they are evil people. But, you know, unfortunately there are preachers out there that uninter unintentionally preach um, work salvation. And I'm not saying that those people are not saved. I'm not saying that those people will be accursed if they preach work salvation. But you know what? And I prayed that this morning. That, you know, if there are good men preaching work salvation, that number one, that they would be corrected either by God or by a brother in Christ. Or, you know, that they would stand up, if they do believe it, that they would stand up for the truth amongst their peers and not care what the fallout is. If their best buddy or their inner circle is preaching repent of your sins or preaching work salvation, I pray that the preachers that do have the right position would stand up for the truth of God's word, even in, in the midst of persecution from their innermost peers. You know, otherwise I pray that God would remove them from the ministry. I pray that God would somehow, you know, destroy their ministry, take them out any way he can before they do more damage. Because let me ask you this, you know, if you're not, you know, if you're not going to split hairs over salvation, like if salvation is not going to be an issue where we really get down to the nitty gritty and split hairs over, then what are we going to split hairs over? You know, amongst Baptist churches these days, you know, they split hairs over, you know, whether or not to call yourself a Baptist or not. You know, you don't call yourself a Baptist, we're going to separate from you. You know, you don't wear a tie and a suit, oh, we're going to separate from you. You don't sing the hymns, we're going to separate from you. Oh, you allow pants on women, we're separating from you. Um, you, you don't use instruments in your church, oh, we're going to separate from you. You don't do door knocking, you, 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 you only do street evangelism or you only do this form of evangelism? Oh, we're going to separate you. But preacher work salvation? Oh, they don't really mean that. You know, they don't, you know, they're, you know they're, they're saying that you have to turn from your sins and every member in their church believes you have to turn from your sins. Every member in their church believes that if they commit some big sin, they're going to lose their salvation. Oh, but that's okay. You know, we're still buddies. We're still going to work with them. They're still our friend. No, if you preach work salvation... You're not my friend. You're not on the same team as me because you are sending people to hell by teaching them that they have to, to do works and this is what our church is against. This is the reason why we go out and preach the gospel because everyone is believing in works and you're just adding to that problem if you preach that you have to keep the commandments to be saved by any of these six forms. You know, so salvation, you know, it's a very serious issue, isn't it? Because it's not just a matter of of physical life and death because it's a matter it's a matter of eternal life and death and that's why it's very serious and that's why we see this warning in the Bible that if anybody preaches another gospel let him be accursed <laughs>